10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to get started. Thanks, everybody, for sharing and for bearing with me. I'm going to share. Nope, I'm not going to share my screen yet. I am going to start by thanking everyone for being here, for letting you know that we are recording today. So just be aware of that. And for anyone who's interested in looking at older, um, not small favorites, lunch and learns, <laughs> they're all posted on our YouTube channel. So check those out. We are um, here in Philadelphia at the Clay Studio. We are um, on traditional Lenny Lenape land. So we wanna acknowledge that we are here on the, that traditional territory. And in our acknowledgement of the continued presence of Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great chief Tamanend, that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. So I just, I love seeing all of your faces and being with you every week. And um, I'm so excited to be opening the show. It's the 16th Small Favors. We have 200 artists who have participated. We have, um, our, we're so grateful to Kintsuki Yamada, who I think might be here with us. I saw his name before, um, for being a juror this year for the show. He and I had a good time. Um, looking through the over 800 objects that were submitted for the exhibition. So it was also just such a pleasure that people um, are interested in the show and want to participate. So thanks to all of you for that. We are gonna start with um, the six artists, well, seven really, who are with us today. Laura Mecklenberger, Catherine Schroeder, PJ Hargraves, Janine Pinnell, whose name I now am spelling correctly, Luke Hewlett and Nam Ceramics, which is um, Rebecca Mint Mil Minton. She changed her name on her screen. <laughs> and um, Scott Proctor. So we are gonna start with Janine. And I am going to ask her to um, talk to us a little bit about how, how she, um, to introduce herself and talk to us about her background in clay and art. Thank you for including me in the show. I'd like to say thank you. And also thank you for your hard work and all the staff at the clay studio for hanging all those tiny little boxes. Uh, I hope I get a chance to get out there just to see all those little boxes. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my journey to clay uh, was a little non-traditional. I uh, grew up in the 80s in a very blue collar town where many of my friends were the first people in their family to go to college. Uh, as a young person, I started working, I'm sorry, I started um, attending the Art Students League in New York City and I studied figure drawing and then I went on to uh, study at Mason Gross, uh, the College of Art. And then I left school and opened up my own gallery. So for 25 years, I was a gallerist and, um, and I really enjoyed that part of my life. But after a while, I decided I wanted to get back to making art again. So in 2017, I found that I was attracted to working with clay. So I started with kiln fired clay and then I was introduced to paper clay. And I started to experiment with porcelain and stoneware paper clay. Um, and many of you who work with clay will know a little bit about paper clay. Um, you use it, many of you will use it to fix things. Um, it's regular clay that's infused with cellulose fibers. And um, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it has a soft fluffiness to it if you make your own clay. And so you have the ability to make uh, different size things, thinner things. Uh, it gives you a little bit more flexibility in working. So I started making these figures in clay. Many of them are autobiographical and a lot of the figures I make are based on um, my own face. Uh, so I'm playing with different kinds of feelings of um, uncertainty in life and uh, challenges that I might have to uh, face um, and sometimes donning a, a different mask in the world uh, has helped me get through some tough times. So um, 
that's just a little bit about my process. Well, thanks, um, Janine. I'm, and I believe you are, you have your studio over in New Jersey, is that right? Yes, I live in Stockton, New Jersey. My husband and I have a very small alpaca farm uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to take one of those rooms and turn it into my studio. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I'm, I, I think I might finagle myself a visit because I really think alpaca- uh, Anytime, is feel free to come by. <laughs> um, so do you want to talk a little bit um, in maybe about two more minutes about working small and your, the challenge of thinking about small favors? Sure. I'm the reverse of most of the artists. I, I work small. Um, I, and since I'm new to the practice and I'm mostly self-taught, I'm just slowly learning about how, uh, t how to use clay and how to work big. I have a very small kiln, so all of my pieces need to stay inside, you know, the, the confines of my kiln. Um, but my work in general is approachable, so you need to get into the space of my pieces. Uh, they, they're well, you're welcome to pick them up and handle them, um, but they're meant to be small little objects of art. That, so that's great. So this was sort of a, a, a more normal thing for you, and so, um, yeah. <laughs> I love the, the eyes. Um, the face is so expressive, and it really does kind of draw you in and um, make you Think about what, what that little guy's thinking about. So That's sort of what I'm thinking about most of the time. <laughs> yeah. the, the little car uh, that you see at the bottom there, my little fish car, I started that series during the pandemic. Uh, I've named it Absurd Travel. And so what I've been working on is creating different types of vehicles that um, sort of flights of fancy to sort of help me travel in my mind because I can't travel anywhere on my own. So. I'm looking to uh, to see where that takes me. That's a lovely thought, yeah. Well, and I think we're having a fish theme now. So we've talked about fish coming back to life and now fish That's traveling. Good. We'll see how, how long we can keep that going. Thanks so much, Janine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're gonna go to PJ now. So PJ, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how, um, you began in the clay and, and art world. Yeah, definitely. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my screen, but I'm wearing my uh, art opening jacket that I always wear. Um, so since we can't be there in person, I just wore that today. Um, but I'm originally from uh, Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which if you're familiar is kind of like halfway between Lancaster and Philadelphia. Um, and then I moved to Philadelphia. I went to Tyler School of Art for undergrad. Um, and so I remember vividly my first experience going to the clay studio uh, in my beginning ceramics class with Nick Cripple. Um, and that was just like a really pivotal time, like having this amazing place in Philly um, to go to art openings and just like meet a lot of ceramic artists. Um, so I think the clay studio was really important for me as like getting really excited about ceramics early on. Um, and there was a lot of crossover between like you know, uh, resident artists at the clay studio that would uh, come and be teachers at Tyler. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was all really amazing. I bought my first like piece of real pottery at the clay studio. Uh, that's a Doug Peltzman mug. I still have it. Um, but yeah, um, I from there I moved to uh, Nebraska for grad school. So I'm still living in Nebraska now. Um, currently I'm a resident artist at the Lux Center. Um, which I think there's some other Lux Center people here. So shout out Lux Center. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, I mean, you can see in this current work that I'm doing um, the, these influences of like Pennsylvania folk art and Pennsylvania Dutch art really kind of influence the imagery that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm, I'm concentrated on like making these uh, really joyful and optimistic sculptures. Yeah. Well, and I think the bird form is often aspirational, like makes us think about, well, like the fish um, and Janine's the traveling, like it allows us to go to other places. Um, and, and I love your tiny pots too on the, on one of those tree forms. So you, I know you've been in, um, engaged in small favors before. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, the challenge of translating your work into the, into the cube? 
Yeah, so um, I think Small Favors is like one of my favorite shows that comes up at the beginning of every year. Um, and so like after New Year's, that's one of the first things I like to do is like get in the studio and make some uh, small little things for that show. Um, I think this year will be the fifth year that I've done it. Um, so I really just love love doing that every year. Um, and for me, it's um, it's really different from the way I normally work. So like my sculptures typically are um, like around three to five feet tall. So a much larger scale than the small favors. Um, so it's really exciting for me to like work small um, for, you know, for the purpose of the show. But then also I feel like I often discover things and um, take things from making those small objects and translate that uh, back into my larger work. So it's kind of this back and forth um, between the two scales that I really like. I love that idea of taking sort of the problem solving necessities of each set of parameters and having them inform each other. That's so cool. So are these other, the three on the right, are those all like three to five feet tall? Yeah, those ones are a little bit larger. Those were some works from my MFA thesis show. So those are all about five feet tall. Are they made in parts? I'm always thinking about like transporting things now and how to put it in the gallery. <laughs> yeah, so, big <laughs> so those are made in two pieces. So like the tree section is almost like a lid um, and the bottom part is like the, the jar, if you will. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're still impossible to move. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I, I, uh, one of the pieces is in the student show in Cincinnati, and I just had to drive it there because there was no way for me to ship uh, the tree section, just so fragile. Um, so I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> and yet another set of parameters to think about. Cool. Well, thanks so much, PJ. Yeah, thank you. It's, it was always nice to see PJ come in the gallery and now we uh, we'll just have to see him from afar. That's okay. I always want everyone to move back to Philadelphia. I think it's great here. Laura Mecklenberger is up next. Hey, Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, sure. Um, I live in Philadelphia. I'm in West Philly. Um, I went to Swarthmore for my undergrad, which is part of how I ended up in Philadelphia. Um, Sid Carpenter was my mentor and she's been a wonderful mentor ever since too. Um, and then I, I did a post-baccalaureate at UMass Dartmouth and another one at Tyler. And then, so I was with Nick Cripple also, he's wonderful. Um, and then my, my master's at Penn State. Um, and so this, the images I put here are a little bit of like a throwback Thursday, since <laughs> it's Thursday, um, because I wanted to kind of show how I ended up at making tiny, um, tiny mushroom jewelry and other, other nature jewelry. Um, so the, the one in the middle there that has the, the tree stump with mushrooms was a commissioned wedding gift. Um, where the mushrooms are symbolizing kind of uh, purifying the space because they can do, mushrooms in nature do an incredible job of um, breaking down um, toxins and complicated molecules, uh, even, um, even uh, polymers and, uh, uh, sorry, I'm blanking. Man -made, even man-made materials, is that? Yeah, like toxic things to the extent where if it's an edible mushroom, like oyster mushrooms, which are the one um, hanging, um, they can actually be edible after eating um, toxic things. So uh, I was thinking about that and it's, um, so if you see the, the one in the upper corner, that is the shrine vulnerary, um, which was from my graduate time at Penn State. It's an 800 pound shrine that turned the room into a temple for a week. Um, so that piece, it was really amazing working that huge, but I also really like to think on a tiny scale. So all of the tiny little, um, little sort of prayer objects and amulets all over it are tiny porcelain things and other mixed media. and. I've always been kind of obsessed with miniatures ever since I was a little kid and making tiny things. 
So I was creating a giant home for all of these small things that will draw you in to look at them. And the, the ending of that piece was actually like really emotionally powerful for me because I wasn't able to find a home for the um, So after I deinstalled it, um, I, was, I was trying to find a good place for it in time and I ended up having to destroy it um, because I couldn't keep it in their loading dock forever. Um, so what that made me think about was how do I make things that are easier for people to take home with them, um, easier for people to transport, easier to have in people's homes, but still have this um, ability to be useful and you know affect your space that you live in. Um, so jewelry was actually one of the um, effects of that because I was thinking you know you can wear them, they're incredibly small, you can ship them easily. Um, you can carry it with you. So after I made this um, wedding gift piece, I started making the, the jewelry. Um, I'm actually wearing one right now. Um, so that's been kind of a sideline for me for years that as I'm making um, more, you know, one and two foot scale things, I'm also making the jewelry. Um, so the piece in the, the lower corner is a close up of my more recent shrine that I did um, at University City Arts League a couple of years ago uh, called Reliquary of Burdens. And each of those pieces is a, um, it held a piece of paper with somebody's, um, something that felt burdensome to them. So, you know, something that was a fear or a responsibility or a trauma they'd experienced. It, you know, people sent me messages and either the actual paper they'd written or I wrote it down for them. Um, and then I did a ritual as they were in the kiln so that um, that smoke from the burning paper would go to the ancestors. And so this is an ancestral shrine. Um, and there's all kinds of symbolism in there that, that I don't have time to get into, but they're really, really light pieces. They, you, you pick them up, they're kind of like an egg. They're pinched pinch pot forms, closed pinch pot. Um, so when you pick them up, they feel, um, you, you feel the hollowness of them and the little holes in them also show you how hollow they are. Yeah. So I was thinking about, you know, what, what are the alternative ways to think about a vessel since ceramics does vessels really well. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the other work that I do lately um, is very mixed media. I, I use polymer clay in my other work too, my larger sculptural pieces, and also wire and um, paper mache and a whole bunch of other materials. Um, still trying to strive for that lightness and, and something that draws you in. But even in my larger pieces, I love thinking about tiny detail. They all have you know, really intricate surface detail and, and tiny things that draw you in to look close. Yeah, so, yeah. that's so great. As much as I, I'd love to do a big thing again in the future, but even my giant things will always have tiny things. <laughs> well, that's lovely. And um, I have to say that I find jewelry very meditative and that there, I, I think, I imagine you have this thought as well, that the idea of a shrine and something that you're kind of you know, um, have it using as a contemplative focus is very effective when you're wearing it. So that's kind of a nice, a nice translation from that lar larger scale piece down to the small thing. So that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, and, and I love that we have both ceramic people who are making jewelry, we have jewelers in the show who don't necessarily work with clay as well, but um, it's kind of, it's nice when the two things come together this way. So thanks, Laura. Excellent. Okay, so um, now we're gonna ask Catherine Schroeder to introduce herself and I am going to let everyone know that I, um, I don't have the installed photo of her work here, but in a, a couple of hours, when you go over to the website and look, look you'll be able to see it there. So this is a similar work um, on the bottom left. So Catherine, if you want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself to everybody. 
Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, I know that it's a huge task. You only have 300 of them to worry about, <laughs> so thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Catherine Schroeder and I'm coming to you guys from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, this is the land of Omaha, Pawnee, and Sioux tribes, so this is where I'm from. Um, I got my BFA from Alfred a long time ago. Um, I've worked as an educator and a studio artist for the last 12 years and started back for my MFA at Illinois State um, University and then got to work with PJ at um, University of Nebraska Lincoln for just a little bit. So um, yeah, I work in Omaha now. Mm -hmm. And the pieces that you guys see are, they weren't made specifically for small favors. This is my first time in the show. And I just thought that this work was a fit for it. Um, the piece on the left, if you're seeing it on your screen, it's probably about life size. It's really tiny. It's about an inch and a quarter. Um, and the pieces on the right range from about two and a half to four feet wide. And this body of work is actually really about the relationship of scale and um, the poetics of making on these different scales. Um, the body of work kind of just juxtaposes these nests, which the work that's in the show is actually a bird's nest that is cast in slip. Um, and then it has this really metallic surface. So I like the conversation about jewelry because I feel like this is one of those tiny meditative pieces that kind of has, um, has those qualities that also is kind of fun for me because I feel like it's as much a found object sculpture because it's just a cast bird's nest. Somebody else made it to start with. Um, and then these other pieces on the right are just kind of expanding on the idea of how birds work to build their nests and how those vessels are architectural and what is similar about our making vessels, these sculptural vessels that kind of reference that weaving, reference that um, use of found materials and are also just um, poetic vessels, right? An exploration of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I love the vessel and the, the mixed media. And then the, um, can you talk a little bit about, when I look at them, the sheen of the glaze, mm -hmm. I don't know, it, it looks almost, it looks so leather-like as well. Are you sort of thinking about referencing other materials? Definitely. Um, the one that's on the top right, it actually, because of the scale, I had to um, fire it in an electric kiln because that was what it fit in <laughs> at the time. Um, but that piece uses um, wire, these found willow branches, and to make clay speak back to the, those other materials kind of um, beg something of the glazes that uh, it's just hard to um, make those kind of sympathetic to each other, the materials. Um, the one on the bottom right, and actually come to think about it, the, all of the bird's nests, is, nests are salt fired as well. Um, so that's where that sheen comes from. It's a uh, local Nebraska clay from Endicott, which I think you guys have bricks in your new building from Endicott. I just noticed oh, I follow the brick companies. <laughs> oh, I have to. That's exciting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that um, what I know we were getting some special stuff for the facade. So maybe that's what that is. Maybe. Yeah. I just, I just remember seeing that and thinking, oh, there's, there's a little piece of Nebraska there, literally. <laughs> hey. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I guess what I have to say is seeing these works together, it, um, it's kind of a fun experience to me to see it, the nest spotlighted because when I saw them um, in that exhibition of this body of work, they're so tiny. And to me, they're almost like the period at the end of the sentence, they're so important because they're kind of the 
symbolic object that inspired all of the rest of the work. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really glad to see it, these pieces, these tiny, very, very important pieces so spotlighted. So thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Um, um, it's, it is nice to see that it's on the screen, at least they're the same size. And I love to hear that you've taken the, this tiny thing made by a bird and that that's what's inspired um, the other works and you just really so skillfully and beautifully have captured the the textural qualities of kind of many different materials and that's it's the mystery of when you look at these forms and you're like what is that and it makes you want to look at it further and examine the structure it's really beautiful so thank you for sharing with us thank you thanks for the opportunity yeah. um Thanks, Catherine. Okay, so we are going now to invite Luke to introduce himself. Hi. There you go. Thanks, Luke. How are you doing? Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jennifer, and uh, thank you, Kinsuke, as well. Um, I've been to the Clay Studio once, but um, I've had many people who've been residents throughout um, you know, the time that the Clay Studio has been open that have really influenced my career, like Linda Cordell and uh, Chris Boger. So, um, you know, I think we're all connected in our own way, right? Um, but um, near, um, a little bit about me and my work, nearly all of my work in the past has been figurative in some way um, or another. And in my early years, I really focused um, portraying stories of other people. Um, while I was a resident at uh, the Lux Center for the Arts in Lincoln, Nebraska, I worked part-time as a, an activities director in an Alzheimer's and dementia nursing home. Um, each day, it was really great because I would bring in little bits of clay with me and I would uh, teach them how to make pinch pots and little sculptures. And, um, you know, we can all agree that Alzheimer's is a horrible disease, right? But one positive that I found from working there is that it really opened up these people and it really made them vulnerable. And um, I, I got really quickly became friends with these people and learned about love and loss and different things like that. So I took that idea of vulnerability into graduate school with me at Indiana University and I started focusing on um, common examples of this perception versus reality in our society as a whole. And um, I remember, I feel like we all have those one, that one critique that kind of influences us in graduate school that kind of changes our work in a way. And um, for me, it was with uh, Chase Gamblin. He came up to me, uh, who was one of my professors there. And he said that I really wanted to connect with my audience. I needed to put more of myself in my work and make, uh, make it less generalized about society. So um, this really catapulted me um, into an introspective uh, look at my work um, and really influenced everything after that. Um, those first two images that you're seeing with the with the zipper motif is from um, is from my zipped relations um, body of work where I was really focusing on this idea of emotional facades and the the implication of a disguised self. Um, I'm interested in the ease and routine nature of stretching the truth in terms of identities, feelings, and afflictions, and what might result of feeling camouflaged in your day-to-day -day life. So um, I myself, um, I, 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 I kind of say this as a joke, but I identify with the whole sad clown paradox where um, I'm, I'm, it's really common for me to hide behind a, you know, a joke or a, a cheesy laugh um, and to get behind my anxiety. And I'm still trying to figure out if that's a conscious or subconscious feeling, if, you know, if it was innate or not. Um, but my environment, um, has always influenced much of my work. And in these last photos, you can see one of the pictures of my in progress work. Um, um, I really have used this um, idea of my environment and this last year really to um, really dig into the topic of my, um, my recent work. So a large portion of this last year has really seemed to stifle my creative process in one way. And I felt like somewhat like an imposter. I, I feel like a lot of um, people might have um, where I had this like underlying guilt for not creating as much work as I had done in the past years. So um, in the pandemic, I found myself more, more alone. And these times, um, these in-person conversational facades that I mentioned earlier uh, became more and more distant as my interactions with others dwindled. Um, in the first months of quarantine, I remember reading tales of my friends becoming ill and the cases in the United States rising. Um, and it, it kind of gave me, um, I, I think some of you can relate, it kind of gave me a little bit of slight agoraphobia. You know, um, there's this interesting point when my home started feeling like more of a bunker than a dwelling. Um, so I had this 
this really big fear of leaving yet an underlying uh, urge to, to really escape. So um, I came to realize that the, the, this emotional facade that I once depicted with the zipper motif in my other pieces in my earlier work transformed into this physical facade for me. Um, for the first time I could actually, you know, see um, what was separating me from those around me in, in, in a more tangible way. And it was this house, these four walls. So um, I'm really further exploring this idea in my new work and questioning the idea of a home and the occupant and how, you know, they can both blend into a, one entity. So um, for this show, it, it was really hard for me because I, I typically make work that is, uh, you know, three to four foot tall. Um, and my, uh, my, my partner, she was really excited because she's usually my right hand man to help me move things. And when I, um, <laughs> when I showed her that it could just fit in her hand, she, she, you know, she was so ecstatic that she didn't have to pull her back out or <laughs> any things like that. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I really like doing little detailed things like uh, the little zippers on those pieces are put in one by one. So it was like, um, it felt familiar yet different to me in a way. Um, I was also really excited about the shipping cost. It was the least I've ever paid for shipping in my entire life. Um, <laughs> for shipping out a piece. Um, it was like the first time it's been under a hundred dollars. So, um, you know, I, I think it's something that I really got to think about um, because I was able to, to communicate this idea and this story in such a small amount of time. And, um, you know, not, not spend months and months on a piece. So I really enjoy that. And uh, I'm probably going to do it more in the future because of you guys. So thank you. That is so great to hear. Thank you for that um, beautiful explanation. And um, I just want to, I realized I didn't say before, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. And uh, when we're done, I will get to them. So I, I really love that you, you said that someone told you to put more of your self in your work. Yes. <laughs> one minute later you said you liked puns because you really did put yourself in your work yeah yeah <laughs> um, so that's great even yeah. even the crit uh response was a pun oh but yeah it's so effective i mean it's, 